we'll go ahead and get started um, since we already have 17 people on board. So uh, hopefully that will uh, it may grow even a little bit, but uh, we'll see. That's a pretty good um, turnout. Um, of course, Henry, they're all here for you because uh, you're the star of the show. Um, and I'll turn the uh, seminar over to Henry to uh, introduce the paper. And uh, I think you're going to share the screen. All right. Can everyone see that? Everyone can see the slides? Great. Hi, Fonko. Good to see you. Um, well, thank you very much for having me, Ross. Thanks, everyone, for attending. It's good to see so many friendly faces. Uh, you all know who I am. I'm Henry from uh, Politics and Global Studies. I'm really happy to present this as a book project that I've been working on for a while, um, a few years, actually. And uh, I have a draft book in manuscript that I workshopped a couple of months ago, but this is still very much a work in progress, so please uh, bear with me. I also am going to cover a lot of ground, so I'm probably going to move pretty quickly through the slides. Uh, I hope that everyone can follow me and that uh, things don't get too crazy. Please stop me if you don't understand anything, if you have any questions, but I will try and probably keep moving uh, pretty quick to get through all of this in about 45 minutes. So. The subject of this talk is uh, Elite Cohesion and Coercive Capacity in Socialist uh, Central and Eastern Europe. I'm trying to explain variation in the size of the secret police agencies in Socialist uh, Eastern Europe during the Cold War. Um, just to give you an overview of the, of the presentation, I'm going to start, as most people do when they talk about uh, secret police agencies or coercion under dictatorship with the violence delegation problem. I'm going to sorry, uh, lay out the puzzle that I'm trying to explain, which is this uh, significant variation in the size or what I call the coercive capacity of uh, secret police agencies in this region during the Cold War. And then I'm gonna briefly lay out my theory, which is that uh, elite cohesion, that is the ability of groups of elites, not single dictators to band together to control the secret police is associated with greater coercive capacity. So basically, elites delegate more coercive capacity to secret police chiefs when they feel that they can control them. And then my empirical analysis is based on the using Stalin's death in March 1953 as an exogenous shock to the elite cohesion of these uh, ruling communist regimes in the region. And I study its effects using a difference and differences framework where we have two groups of states, one group of elites that are affected severely by this political shock and one that are not affected as severely. And I'll walk you through that as we go along. So the violence delegation problem, what is this? Well, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here. Uh, this is a famous example of the violence delegation problem, probably one of the most famous examples. On the left here, we have uh, Adolf Hitler, and his uh, subordinate Ernst Röhm, who was uh, the famous leader of the Nazi Sturmabteilung, the paramilitary group that was very powerful within the Nazi party up through the early 1940s. Uh, and Ernst Röhm, of course, was a very powerful figure within the Nazi party, a very powerful ally of Adolf Hitler, but also a threat to Hitler. And that's why uh, in this somewhat lovely looking hotel here, here on the right, uh, in Bad Wiesi in Bavaria, uh, Rum was arrested during the so-called Night of the Long Knives in 1934 and very uh, shortly thereafter shot because Hitler and in particular his other subordinates, Himmler, it all did not trust the room. Uh, although he'd been delegated a lot of capacity to, to of violence and coercion, he was not trusted by the regime. This is another famous example of the, of the uh, violence delegation problem. On the left here we have Joseph Stalin, obviously Soviet dictator from 1922 to 1953. Everybody knows who he is. And on the right, we have here Lavrenti Beria, his chief of the secret police, first the so-called NKVD, and then uh, subsequently the KGB as Minister of Internal Affairs. Now, Beria was, of course, a very extremely powerful figure within the Soviet regime. And in fact, uh, as this new story here illustrates, he was the most powerful figure within the Soviet regime directly after Stalin's death. You can see this is a nice uh, picture from the New York Times before uh, Beria's purge in 1953. He's shown here along with the other ruling elites, Malenkov, Molotov, etc. But then due to their lack of trust in Beria, they thought Beria was too powerful. And so along with uh, Marshal Zhukov, 
and uh, subsequently General Secretary Khrushchev Beria was arrested and thereafter also uh, killed by the Soviet regime. So this problem of uh, enabling but controlling those individuals tasked with repression and violence in authoritarian regimes is a very significant problem uh, at the center of authoritarian politics. And of course, uh, many scholars study this problem. Uh, for example, here's a quote from a pa recent paper by Eberov and Sonnen, the possibility of treason by a close associate has been a nightmare of most autocrats throughout history. In the words of uh, Milan Smolik in a very uh, recent paper, 2013, why is it in some countries, those with guns obey those without guns? Or as uh, Sheena Greitens asks, and I think this is also my research question in this, in this project, how do rulers simultaneously give the security forces the capacity for violence and progress that, uh, sorry, prevent that capacity from being directed towards them? That's my research question in this project as well. And the way I get at this question uh, empirically is to study very, very similar cases, very, very uh, variation among very, very similar cases and what we call in comparative politics the most similar systems set up. So the cases I study are shown here in light pink and are called USSR aligned countries. That was Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland and Romania. Those are the six cases in my analysis. These are all states that were uh, constructed by the Soviet Union in the immediate aftermath of World War II. They obviously share a lot of geographic similarities uh, for that reason, but they also share very important other similarities as well for comparative analysis. For example, these are all single party regimes. I show here on the left uh, all the logos of these uh, single parties, the Bulgarian Communist Party, the German, German uh, Socialist Unity Party, as it was known, the Czech Communist Party, the Polish United Workers Party, the Communist Party of Romania, and so on. Not only were these single party communist regimes, but they were also all in the geopolitical orbit of the Soviet Union. I have here the logo of the uh, Warsaw Pact Alliance. All of these countries' uh, militaries were under the control of the Soviet Union. And to a large extent, these countries' politics were affected by the Soviet uh, Communist Party, the logo of which I show here on the right. So these are really, by um, comparative standards, very, very similar uh, countries. And uh, not only were they similar in their geopolitical position and in their political regimes, but they all had very, very similar coercive institutions or uh, secret police agencies. Now, you may have heard of some of these uh, I show here the uh, names of each of these agencies, some of which I can pronounce and some of which I cannot. I'm sure all of you have heard of the East German Stasi, the Ministry for State Security. Uh, you may have heard of the Romanian Securitate. These are the most notorious of these secret police agencies for reasons actually that I will explain in this talk. But uh, in all of these countries, there was one major coercive agency modeled on the Soviet agencies, the NKVD, and later the KGB, I show the logos of those two organizations uh, on the right. These were very, very similar institutions. Their organizational structures were almost identical. I won't go into a lot of detail now, but I can if people have questions. Uh, they all basically did the same thing. These were integrated coercive agencies. They fulfilled the task both of domestic repression and counter espionage. So they, they fulfilled the tasks of both the FBI and the CIA. Uh, to use the analogous American institutions. And they all were created in the mold of these Soviet institutions and in fact created by Soviet officers in the aftermath of the war. So these were very similar agencies. And the agencies did similar things. I'm gonna present some photos here from um, the German Ministry of, East German Ministry of State Security because that's the case I know the best. Uh, they, had, they had teams of officers uh, they were organized uh, by military rank, as you see here in the bottom left corner. They ran prisons like the former prison in Berlin Hornschönhausen, which is now a museum that you can actually uh, visit in East Berlin. You can see here the cells and the hallways of that prison uh, as it was operated under the communist regime. They, all of these uh, agencies did these things. 
but some of you might be familiar with the East German Stasi, perhaps from the film The Lives of Others that I show here in the top left-hand corner. Uh, the Stasi grew by the end of the 1980s to be a very, very large institution. You can see from the enormous complex here on the right, which is its main uh, campus in Berlin Lichtenberg. And you can see that it was also very well resourced. It had very modern computers, at least for the communist states of the day. And you can see here, the Minister, Minister of State Security's offices, relatively nice, preserved here exactly as it was left by uh, the minister in 1989. And you might think, as, as I did, a, a scholar of German history, that these uh, agencies were all very similar in size and the things that they did. But that couldn't be further uh, from the truth, in fact. Because here I showed the figures in the num on the number of officers and informants employed by the Stasi from 1952 through 1989. And you can see, we see here a trend of continual growth. The Stasi grew uh, throughout the course of the communist regime to be a very large, very capable agency. However, when we compare it to other agencies, uh, in terms of a number of officers, full-time staff, the Stasi is really an exception. Although the Stasi was a very similar size, compared to other agencies in the 1950s, the early 1950s, it really started to diverge after that and become much, much larger. You can see here that the agencies in other cases were nowhere near as large as the Stasi by the 1980s. And if we also look at the number of secret informants employed by these agencies, the story becomes a little more complex. Uh, all of these agencies were relatively similarly sized in the 1950s, except for the Bulgarian agency, which was uh, enormous for its time. Uh, but after the early 1950s, they started to diverge. The GDR agency grew, as did the Romanian agency. They recruited a lot of secret informants. Uh, but in other cases, the agencies shrank, particularly in Hungary and Poland and in Czechoslovakia. And so this is really the puzzle that I'm trying to explain in this project is why would the coercive agencies under these extremely similar regimes in a geographically contiguous space vary so much through space and time? And by answering that question, I'm hoping to, that we're gonna learn a little bit about uh, the violence delegation problem and how it can and potentially is solved by, um, by autocrats. Now, it's not that there is no previous work on this uh, question. In fact, there were some really interesting studies done during the Cold War and subsequently on communist uh, dictatorships specifically. Uh, and many people thought that there was a sort of a common life cycle of repression. So the life cycle, the repression was incredibly intense and violent in the early years of the communist regimes, but declined subsequently. And although you can see that that was true in some cases, uh, when we look at the size of these agencies, like in Poland and Czechoslovakia, it wasn't true in other cases, particularly in the GDR and Poland. Uh, more modern theories of coercive agency design and repression under authoritarian regimes focus on the threat magnitude and type. Uh, and they argue that the large agencies are associated with mass revolutionary threats, whereas uh, smaller agencies are associated with more elite threats. Now, I don't find that to be true in these cases, either specifically because in the early 1950s, when all these agencies were very similar, almost every regime experienced revolutionary unrest uh, and it's not clear why some responded by growing their coercive apparatuses and some responded by shrinking them. Now, I think that one of the reasons that we haven't got a real satisfactory explanation of this variation from previous literature is uh, because of their theoretical approach. So most explanations focus on the principal agent problem between a dictator and their coercive agent, the head of the secret police. Now, dictators uh, delegate the detection or oppression of opposition to these coercive uh, agents, that's quite clear that that is their job. But of course, by delegating the power of uh, intelligence and violence to these individuals, they create a massive problem for themselves in terms of monitoring and sanctioning these coercive agents. Most theories of the control of these sorts of uh, repressive actors, they focus on this principal agent problem between these two uh, individuals. So they think that you can appeal to the coercive agent's self-interest by giving them resources. You can try and create a balance of power among the coercive agents by creating multiple coercive agents who check on each other. Or you can uh, try and re refer to existing loyalties of political parties or ethnic groups to try and have very loyal coercive agents that uh, will not uh, sort of defect from your preferences. But 
as I'm happy to go into in more detail if people have questions, I don't really think that that can explain what's going on here, here either. Um, so we do have a situation in Eastern Europe where there are dictators and there's secret policemen. There is a principal agent problem here. We have here, for example, Walter Ulbricht, the first leader of uh, the German Democratic Republic, and his uh, secret policeman, Erich Mücke, the Minister of State Security for over 30 years from 1957 to 1989. We have leaders like Nicolae uh, Ceausescu in Romania uh, and his Minister of the Interior for a short period in the mid-1970s, Emil Bobu. And we also have people like uh, Władysław Gomułka in uh, Poland, who was the leader for about 14 years, and his notorious Minister of the Interior, uh, Michał Mocha. Uh, but I don't really think that it's the relationship between these two individuals, this principal agent relationship that really determines the outcomes of agency size that I observe. And the reason is because these elites don't govern alone, they govern as groups. Now, this is, uh, I think, a nice photo of an example of one of these groups. This is the Central Committee of the East German Socialist Union, Unity Party at their 11th plenum uh, in December, just before Christmas 1965. And you can see here sitting in the middle, Walter Ulbricht, uh, whose photo I showed you just a second ago, and to his right, is actually his uh, heir and eventual successor, uh, Eric Honecker. But of course, you can see that uh, these politburos and central committees, and this is the case for most authoritarian regimes, dictators aren't trying to solve this problem of delegation to the repressive agents or coercive agents alone. They're trying to solve this problem as groups. And so what I argue or, uh, in, this, in my book manuscript is that uh, the means of monitoring and sanctioning the coercive agent are not only possessed by the dictator themselves and don't have to be possessed, possessed by the dictator themselves, they're distributed among a group of elites. And of course, it's probably true that no single member of the ruling coalition can monitor and sanction the coercive agent, including the dictator. Because the dictator has delegated all this power to the secret police chief, he cannot monitor and control that secret police chief by himself. But if the ruling coalition acts as a group, they have as a group enough information on the activities of the coercive agent and enough capacity in terms of violence and resources to control that uh, coercive agent. So just to illustrate, uh, to return to the example that I've discussed before, we see here on the left a very young Erich Mirka in the left-hand panel at the very left back in 1958, speaking to the National Minister of Defense of the GDR, Willi Storff, and also one of his deputies and later the man who becomes the Minister of Defense, Heinz Hofmann. This is a nice depiction that the means of violence is distributed among the group of elites. And here on the right, this is a photo from 1987, many decades later. Mielke is still there. You can just see him in behind the leader, uh, Erich Honecker, but right in front of him is again, Willi Storff. So the means of controlling these coercive agents, whether it's the Minister of Defense or the Minister of State Security, is distributed among the elite as a whole. So elite cohesion, as I call it, which is the ability to control these coercive agents, it emerges as a solution to a coordination game. Uh, defections from this coordination, from this cooperative equilibrium where the elite work together to monitor and control the coercive agent, they lead to weak control of the coercive agent. And when we have weaker control of the coercive agent, the elites fear the coercive agent, they sanction the coercive agent, and they delegate them reduced coercive capacity. When the elite cannot work together to monitor and control their secret policemen, they fear their secret policemen, and they reduce the resources and the size of their agencies in order to reduce the threat that they pose to the coalition. But I argue that Institutions, very broadly construed, that means informal norms and traditions, but also formal rules and organizational structures, these are the things that foster elite cohesion. It's through institutions that groups of elites can work together to control their, their, their secret policemen. And when 
they can work together and they know that they can deter insubordination by their coercive agents, they'll grant them co greater coercive capacity. So to return to the East German example, because the East German elites knew that they could work together to control Erich Mielke and his ministry, his enormous ministry of state security, they did not fear Mielke. In fact, they enabled him and used him to repress and control opposition within the state much more than they would have if they did not feel that they could uh, control him, feared him, and reduce the size of his agency. Now, the institutions that are at the core of this book and at the core of this study, and I don't have time to talk about this in great detail, but the institution that is at the core of this book is the institution of Stalinism. Now, this is obviously a set of formal institutions and informal norms and traditions that were imposed on these communist regimes by the Soviet Union in, during World War II and in its aftermath. I think it's important to note that the first generation of leaders in this entire region spent World War II uh, in the Soviet Union under Stalin. So Stalinism implied formal institutions like new political parties that merged social democratic and communist parties into what they called parties of the new type. It involved uh, formal institutions like centrally planned economies, very swift industrialization and agricultural collectivization. And of course, as I just discussed, uh, Stalinism always implied the creation of these repressive institutions, these secret police agencies modeled on uh, their Soviet uh, counterparts. But Stalinism also involved a set of informal norms and traditions, most importantly, democratic centralism and the absolute power of the party leader and a norm of incredibly harsh and violent repression of both mass and elite opposition. So under Stalinism, there was very little room for dissent or debate about what happened with uh, opponents to the regime. Uh, opponents at the mass level were imprisoned or are subject to, to violence, and as were members of the elite. This is the era of Stalinist show trials of uh, members of the Communist Party, uh, et cetera. So just to go over this uh, really briefly again, my argument, uh, elite cohesion emerges as a solution to a coordination problem among elites. Unfortunately, I don't believe that elite cohesion, cohesion is observable. Instead, what I think we can do is we can study shocks to elite cohesion, to the institutions that foster elite cohesion. And I expect uh, negative shocks to elite cohesion to cause declines in coercive capacity. Uh, for reasons that I'll outline in a little more detail uh, in a second. Now, what is the negative shock to elite cohesion that I study in these cases? Uh, it's the death of Stalin. I think you probably were all waiting for this slide. Well, here it is. The death of Stalin is the exogenous shock to elite cohesion that I'm studying uh, in this book. Stalin's death in 1953 was not only unexpected, it caused massive political uh, ramifications for all of the regimes in the region. Uh, it caused a wholesale undermining of these institutions that I just described, this commitment to agricultural collectivization, to industrialization, and very importantly for my argument, to harsh repression, was really undermined across the region. But what's really important to note is that the importance of this transition varied from state to state. So in some countries, uh, we witnessed what I call a post-Stalinist transition. That is, you had the incumbent leader, the, the first post-war Stalinist leader, either resign, as in the case of uh, Bulgaria, where the Stalinist leader Chervenkov resigns at a party congress in 1954 because his Stalinist policies had been so discredited after Stalin's death. In a couple of cases, uh, we see the death of the Stalinist leader. The Czechoslovak leader, uh, Gottwald, actually dies in Moscow while attending Stalin's funeral. And uh, the Stalinist leader of Poland, Beirut, also dies in Moscow a couple of years uh, later. And then the Hungarian party leader, Rakosi, is deposed in an intra-party coup uh, just before the outbreak of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. So the effects of Stalin's death uh, they are significant for the entire region, but they are more significant 
for the ruling coalitions, the disruption of elite cohesion is more significant in these four cases where the Stalinist leader is deposed. In East Germany, Walter Ulbricht is able to very narrowly survive the post-Stalinist uh, upheaval of the region, as is uh, Georgi Udej in Romania. So what we see is this really interesting variation where we have an exogenous shock to elite cohesion in 1953 when Stalin dies, but the magnitude and type of this shock is unequally distributed across the region. It's much, much more significant in Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland than it is in East Germany and Romania. And so this leads me to my basic research design, which is that we have very similar cases as I laid out before. These are very similar regimes, and that controls for a lot of confounding factors that might affect the size of these secret police agencies across the region. But then we also have this exogenous shock with different effects that allows me to look at differences among regimes that emerge in 1953 using a sort of a differences and differences approach where there are two groups, uh, a post-Stalinist transition group, uh, those four cases I just outlined, and a control group, East Germany and Romania, that do not receive this treatment of the post-Stalinist transition. And the post-treatment uh, period is obviously after Stalin's death, after 1953, sorry. And the book as a whole follows a sort of a multi-method approach. I have comparative historical case studies of the GDR in Poland, but I also analyze data on the size of these agencies in terms of officers and uh, secret informants, which is the part of the project that I'm going to uh, present to you now. So in the first empirical chapter, quantitative chapter of the book, I argue that uh, because negative shocks to elite cohesion uh, disrupt elites' ability to uh, sort of to deter insubordination by their coercive agents, by their secret policemen, it leads them to have to sanction these secret policemen more because they do not trust the secret police chief, because they do not feel that they can collectively control that secret police chief. They have to remove the police chief from office more often, either because of insubordination, I'll discuss a case of direct insubordination by a secret police chief in a second, or because they simply fear insubordination. If elites are not cohesive, they're going to fear their secret police chiefs and remove them from office uh, more often. Now, what I argue in this chapter is that the shock of Stalin's death didn't only affect elite cohesion, it affected elite cohesion in different parts of the coercive apparatus differently. Um, I can talk about this more in the Q&A if people have questions, but what I basically argue is that the effects of a post stalinist transition on the military were relatively insignificant because all of the militaries in this uh, region were under the more or less direct control of the Soviet Union. There was very little to fear in terms of insubordination from the people's armies, but the secret police was a different story. The control, the domestic control of the secret police was much weaker after post-Stalinist uh, transitions. So to just give a couple of illustrations of this uh, logic, on the left here, we have a Stalinist case, right? This is the East German uh, case where we did not see a post-Stalinist transition. Walter Ulbricht and his Stalinist ruling coalition remain in power after 1953. And we have here, on the one hand, Erich Mielke, this Minister of State Security, who's in power for over 30 years. He obviously uh, had, enjoys the trust and respect of the ruling coalition. Now, Heinz Hoffmann, the Minister of Defense, you can see is also in position for 25 years. He actually exits office because he dies, Hoffmann dies uh, in 1985. But he has a very, very long tenure. Both the secret police chief and the Minister of Defense have a very long tenure under the Stalinist coalition. In the post-Stalinist case, though, as I showed here for the case of Poland, you'll note that Mietzlaw Mocha, the Minister of the Interior, is only in place for four years compared to his counterpart Mielke in East Germany, who's in place for over 30 years. Now, the reason that Mocha is only in place for four years is because he actually tries to challenge for the party leadership. Uh, he tries to challenge the Communist Party leader to become leader himself. So because of his insubordination, he's removed from office. Nothing like this ever happens under a Stalinist coalition uh, in these cases I'm examining. Now, what's really striking with the Polish case is that 
Wojciech Jaruzelski, the Minister of Defense, he is in place for 15 years, um, for 15 years uh, with absolutely no problem. So the Minister of Defense is in place much longer than the secret police chief because the relations between these different subordinates and the ruling coalition is, is so different. So the hypothesis that I test in this uh, chapter is that post-Stalinist transitions caused the tenures of the secret police chiefs to decline compared to the ministers of defense held, holding the world's constant. And so I collected data on almost, uh, well, over 350 of the secret police chiefs and cabinet ministers in uh, communist Eastern Europe. So this includes every single secret police chief in the region, all the ministers of defense and uh, some other cabinet ministers that I'll show you here in a second. And I simply code uh, the period after Stalin's death and a post-Stalinist transition to look at their effects on the tenure of these individuals in office while controlling for a, a raft of relevant variables that I'm, I'm happy to talk about if people have questions. And this is just a description of the data that I'm working with. So on the left here, you can see the uh, average lengths of tenure, um, average lengths of tenure for these different types of minister. You can, and actually I compare them to the party leader. So you can see here that the party leaders uh, on average are in place much longer than all of their cabinet ministers. The secret police chiefs tend to be on average in place for not as long as the minister's defense, which is what I would expect given the Soviet control over these defense ministries. And then the rest of the, uh, the rest of the ministers is sort of a mixed bag. Health ministers seem to serve a little longer than others, but on average, they serve about the same length as the um, secret police. And this is borne out by a, by a very simple proportional hazards model here on the right, where I plot the survival function or the likelihood that an individual is still in office against the number of months that they're in office. And you can see party leaders last in office longer than defense ministers who last longer than secret police chiefs, but everyone else seems to be sort of packed in there, similar length of tenure. So I estimate a, a proportional hazards model of the uh, survival rate of these individuals, where I code the period after Stalin's death in 1953, and I interact it with an indicator of which agency an individual works in. So are they a secret police chief? Are they a minister of defense? Or are they a minister of something else? Uh, to see how in the post-Stalinist period, the post-Stalinist transition, um, the tenures of these individuals diverged. And just to show you the most important results from uh, my full model here that controls for a lot of different covariates, on the left-hand side, I show here the Stalinist coalition. So the tenures of uh, Minister of Defense and Secret Police Chiefs under Stalinist coalitions. That is, in every case before 1953, and in East Germany and Romania after 1953. And you can see that the tenures of these two types of individual are very similar. There's no significant difference in the length of time that ministers of defense and secret police chiefs are predicted to stay in office. But in Stalinist, sorry, post-Stalinist coalitions, that is in Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Romania, uh, sorry, Hungary and Poland, after 1953, after they experienced these post-Stalinist transitions and leadership transitions, uh, secret police chiefs have significantly shorter tenures than uh, ministers of defense. So my argument here seems to be borne out in the data that where we see these shocks to coalitions and the Stalinist coalitions are disrupted, secret police chiefs can be trusted much less than their counterparts in the Ministry of Defense who are more under the control of the Soviet Union. And so they are replaced more often. They are sanctioned more often by their elite superiors. So that's the first uh, empirical result I wanted to share with you. The second uh, empirical result I wanted to share with you relates uh, quite straightforwardly to the size of the institutions, to this puzzle that I laid out at the start of the uh, presentation. So not only am I interested in how often these coercive agents are sanctioned by their fellow elites, but the effects that this uh, transition, post-Stalinist transition has something on the size of the agencies. So um, I define coercive capacity in this chapter as uh, the ability of agencies to use force. That is, uh, as Charles Tilley, I think, says quite nicely, uh, how, many, how many weapons 
and men to use them are in an agency and also these agencies ability to, to gather information. Um, now, as I've already outlined, I think that the lack of elite cohesion, so a shock to elite cohesion is going to lead them to sanction the coercive agent, not only by removing them from office more, more frequently, but also if these secret police chiefs cannot be trusted, they're also going to be granted fewer resources. They're going to be granted less prestige. Their institutional position within the state bureaucracy is likely to be uh, demoted. They're going to have reduced autonomy. Uh, there'll be tightened control of these agencies and the uh, elite superiors are more likely to intervene in the activities of these uh, coercive agencies. And so I uh, believe or I predict that after post Stalin's transitions, a combination of all these sanctions of these uh, coercive agents and their institutional apparatus is going to cause the capacity of these coercive agencies to decline um, compared to those agencies where we don't see a post Stalinist transition. So to test this data, I constructed a um, country year panel and it's unbalanced because I don't have the same degree of data coverage for each case. Uh, as you can perhaps imagine, it's very difficult to collect data on these secret police agencies, even now after the fall of these regimes. And I collected uh, data for the number of full-time officers that each coercive agency employs. These are individuals like uh, Erich Milke, like the ministers of state security that I showed you before, but also you'll recall this photo I showed you of the Stasi officers marching outside. Those are the sorts of officers that are included in the data set, but also secret informants. Now, secret informants are individuals who registered formally with a coercive agency, with one of these secret police agencies and agreed either to provide information to the agency on their family or on their uh, colleagues, on people from their other social networks, sports clubs, etc., or they may have uh, agreed to provide some other form of assistance. For example, they may have allowed the secret police agency to use their home as a secret meeting place, or they may have owned an apartment that they allowed the secret police to use uh, for their various activities. So those are the individuals that are captured in the data set as well. And again, I'm estimating a very similar uh, model to the model of um, coercive agent tenure, where I'm looking at uh, the effect of the post-Stalinist transition after Stalin's death. And in these models, I also control for a few other factors that I'm happy to discuss if people have, if people have questions about the empirical models. But let me show you uh, the data first, just to illustrate the strengths and weaknesses of the data that I have. I plot here uh, the number of officers simply in thousands of full-time officers in my data set for each uh, case. And in the cases that experienced a post Stalin's transition, I draw in a line for 1953 to illustrate the, the year of that transition. Now, what you'll see is that the data are not perfect. I don't have perfect annual time series data for every single case. Uh, I do for the GDR, um, unsurprisingly, for reasons related to uh, post-transition politics and the bureaucracy in the Federal Republic of Germany, there are very good data for the East German Stasi. I also have surprisingly good data for both Hungary and Poland. Now, these data were provided to me by researchers who work at the respective uh, archives that manage the, the former records, the, sorry, the records of the former secret police. But you can see that although the data are not bad for Czechoslovakia, they're very patchy for Bulgaria and Romania, and that pattern uh, continues for reasons of post-transition politics that I won't go into a lot of detail here. There are simply not as many data available for Bulgaria and Romania. There are some nice stories about uh, people finding bags of records from the Romanian secret police archive uh, being buried in the countryside outside the capital in the early 1990s and things like this. So there's simply not the same access to records in Romania as there is in other cases. The same trend more or less holds for the data on secret informants. The data are good for the, for the GDR for East Germany. They're very good for Poland as well. They are quite good for Czechoslovakia and for Hungary, but they're not really very good at all for Bulgaria and Romania. And we can talk a little bit about the threat to my research design that the missingness of the data poses if people have questions about that as I move forward. But 
uh, you can see that even just eyeballing the data for secret conformance that I'm showing you here, you can see that the year 1953 corresponds to massive drop-offs in the size of the Polish and Hungarian secret police agencies. And although the size of the agency in Poland does recover in the 1980s for reasons uh, specific to Polish history, it doesn't in Hungary. And in Czechoslovakia, the size of the agency really stagnates after 1953 and uh, subsequently declines. And in Bulgaria, the data that we have are really very patchy, but it seems like the size of the agency also stagnated after the post-Stalinist transition. So the model that I'm estimating here is just uh, ordinary least squares. This is a, just a linear regression uh, with a basic difference and difference uh, set up, although in some cases I look at the effect of the treatment through time, not just as a, as a binary variable. So I have an indicator of the period after Stalin's death. I have an indicator for those regimes that experienced a post-Stalinist transition, and I simply interact those two indicators to look and see how the size of institutions diverged between the two groups um, after Stalin's death, while of course including uh, controls, uh, fixed effects for countries and for each and for time, as well as some control variables. Now the main assumption for this uh, research design, uh, underlying this research design is the parallel trends assumption that there are similar trends in the outcome variable before uh, Stalin's death in both sets of cases. Now, if you look here on the left, you can see that the average number of officers uh, in those countries that experienced a post stalinist transition compared to those that did not uh, are relatively similar before 1953, and then they definitely diverge. So in both sets of cases, the number of officers is increasing before 1953. After 1953, the average number of officers significantly declines in the countries that experienced a post stalinist transition whereas it increases in those that did not. And on the right-hand side, you see that the trend is not quite as clear, but nonetheless, uh, I mean, before 1953, the parallel trends are not as clear, but after 1953, uh, we certainly do see this divergence that I expect uh, to see, given my expectations, my theoretical expectations. When I estimate these OLS models here on the left-hand side, I'm just showing a simple coefficient estimate on the interaction between Stalin's death and post the post-Stalinist treatment group, and you can see it's negative and significant uh, in three different models with different sets of control variables. And the right-hand side, I allow the effect of the post-Stalinist transition to vary through time, and what we see is that the statistical significance and to some extent the magnitude of the post-Stalinist uh, transition on the number of officers in the regime it's negative, but it, the size and statistical significance increase through time. And the results for the informants are very, very similar. Uh, the simple diff and diff model, model on the left with the binary indicator of Stalin's death interacted with the binary indicator of the post-Stalin's transition group, uh, negative and significant across different model specifications. And uh, again, the effects take a, a year or two to become statistically significant, but they become statistically significant uh, through time in the right-hand panel as well. So I'm gonna, just going to wrap up here. Uh, to summarize what, um, what I've taken you through today, I know I've, been, I've packed in a lot here, but I started with this violence delegation problem, how, how authoritarian elites or dictators can both enable and control their coercive subordinate, subordinates, and then I made the case that we can perhaps get leverage on this problem, new leverage by looking at these very closely matched cases with very different outcomes in Central and Eastern Europe. And I laid out this theory about elite cohesion as a solution to a coordination problem and, uh, and leading to greater coercive capacity. And then you saw that after Stalin's death, this exogenous shock of Stalin's death that varied in magnitude across the region, um, where we saw a uh, greater exogenous shock. We saw more turnover in secret police chiefs. Secret police had chiefs uh, tenures decline compared to ministers of defense, and uh, these agencies were, were smaller. Um, what do I think are the major takeaways or the major strengths of the, of the project? Uh, I think that what we have here, given the data availability because of the post-transition uh, regimes and the archives that have opened up in Eastern Europe, 
and because of their similarities and this exogenous shock, I think we have a rare opportunity to identify a causal, of, a causal relationship between uh, elite dynamics and coercive capacity. Uh, it's very, comparative studies of coercive agencies are relatively rare and particularly not uh, such well-matched cases as these. I also think that it's a clear case where previous explanations in this simple principal agent model don't really help us to explain this variation for reasons I can go into more detail uh, if you'd like. Um, I think I would like to think that this renewed focus or change of focus on uh, elites control and coercive agents not as a single dictator but as a group is compelling and this idea of elite cohesion is compelling and I think that it makes us perhaps think rethink why dictatorships based on political parties or revolutionary regimes seem to be so stable. Um, and perhaps it's much more based on elite cohesion and coercion rather than observable institutions like the parties themselves or legislatures that they set up. It might be based much more on dictators' ability with elites to control coercion and enforce our order and maintain power in that way. So thank you all very much for your attention so far. This has been hopefully informative. I hope that everyone has followed along and I look forward to questions and discussion. Thanks, thanks Henry. This, um, I was communicating with the audience while you were talking and uh, since we have uh, um, over 30 people on the uh, thing, um, could you uh, stop sharing your screen and we can go back yeah. if we need to? Thanks, that, that will help everyone. Um, I, uh, I thought, uh, I'm sure there'll be some opportunities, uh, but I thought um, that I would um, raise the questions uh, and, and uh, ask people to put their questions in the chat and um, I'll raise them with you and, and unless we end up with a small number of people after a while. Um, so the first question uh, that I think many people uh, would be interested in uh, is about data collection. Um, and uh, Stephen Ricker a um, asked, uh, you know, many of these countries are not uh, happy sharers of data and information. Uh, and he suspects that uh, secret police organizations didn't allow public records, uh, uh, you know, or otherwise post a number of people, they disappeared. So how did you get the data you collected? Are there any problems with that data collection? Um, and collecting the data that you wanted? And are there any problems you anticipate moving forward with data collection? Yeah, I, um, it's a really good question. And one of the most interesting things about this project has been learning about how these data were created and, um, and the turn, handover of these archives from the former governments to the new government and the effects that's had on data availability. So. It's clear that none of these data would have been available, even hints of these data would have been available for 1989. There are estimates of the size of these agencies that were published by researchers before the, before the Berlin Wall, and they are way off. Um, and so what they're based on, the data, are internal records of the secret police that are available because after the secret police uh, were democratized, so to speak, after they were shut down, the archives were handed over to new democratic governments to manage. And in some cases, they've done a very nice job of doing that and a very competent uh, job of doing that and allowed researchers a lot of access, most notably in, uh, in Germany and now also in Poland, but in other cases, they have not done a good job of it, most notably in Bulgaria and Romania. And a lot of that has to do with post-transition politics. Uh, the access to these secret police records is really political because contemporary political parties, particularly in the 90s, would use the secret police records to learn about their opponents and to discredit them if they could. And so, for example, one of the reasons why access to the Polish records has become so good is because they have a right-wing government now that really hates communists. And so they wanted to, people to learn as much as possible about what they see as the crimes of the communist regime. So the Polish situation is quite good. Um, the main concern is that uh, is that I'd have an unequal distribution of data across uh, treated and untreated states, so across post-Stalinist transition states and those countries that didn't have post-Stalinist transitions. And because I don't have very much data on Romania, that's a real concern. 
So what I do in the book is I try and include as much qualitative evidence as I can to, to show that, that my argument holds for the Romanian case, even though my quantitative data aren't as good as I would hope. I hope that answers the question. I have to unmute myself in between these. Uh, could we think about the shock of Stalin's death as presenting more of a threat in places where the pre-Stalinist secret police stayed in power? Uh, the new ones should be less threatening to the elite and more easily controlled. That's a question that the, uh, the speaker asks. So uh, the question is whether there's variation in the, in the institutions and whether there are new institutions set up in the post-Stalinist regimes. Uh, what happened was generally the institutions persisted in one form or another. They may have been promoted or demoted in the state bureaucracy. That's kind of a complex story. Um, but the personnel was changed in almost every case. So we can't say, for example, that uh, the post-Stalinist transition led to a turnover of the people in charge of the secret police, and that's what led to a change in policy, whereas in the cases where there was no post-Stalinist transition, there was no turnover and therefore no change in policy. In fact, in every case, there was new leadership brought into the secret police. And so uh, in every case, uh, the previous secret police were in some way discredited and we had new secret police leaders uh, brought in. And so I, I don't think that we're talking about a story that you simply have different people leading the secret police and that, that new dictators can simply select people who match their preferences. Because if they did, then they wouldn't have to keep replacing them. That's one of the most striking things is that it's not simply that the new post-Stalinist governments came in, changed out the leadership of the secret police and then continued on. They couldn't. They had to keep changing them time and time again, like in the case of this uh, minister Mochar in Poland, because they couldn't control them. And I think that's what's so interesting about these cases is that uh, it's not just about this principal agent problem between the dictator and the secret policeman and you have to get the preferences aligned. That's not, that doesn't seem to be what's going on because uh, in the regimes where the elite cohesion was disrupted, they have to keep changing the secret policeman time and time again afterwards. Thank you. Um, the, the next question, um, we might think that a loss of cohesion means a weaker elite. So why do the coercive forces not just rebel against this weaker elite instead of accepting sanctions? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, again, there's a lot of variation. So uh, in the case of Poland, they try. The secret police does try to challenge the government, but bit by bit, even though the elite cohesion is relatively weak, the government is able to work against the uh, secret police chief, Mocha, and form a coalition, particularly with the Minister of Defense, to eventually, after some time, uh, remove Mocha from, from power, even though he has a very powerful coalition, uh, including um, sort of paramilitary groups that are supporting him. And that, that's the only case where I could find a uh, explicit challenge to the government by the secret police, uh, even in one of these post-Stalinist regimes. In the other, in the other post-Stalinist regimes, it seems that, the, that the, the leaders of the secret police, the secret police was shrunk so quickly that, that they didn't try and pose uh, threats to the regime, or at least not explicitly that I was able to, um, that I was able to find out. But I think that, that when these agencies are very small, when their capacity is reduced so fast, um, that after that, they, they were not able to challenge the regime. Um, as we saw in the case of Poland, eventually after some time this, uh, this individual was able to be brought back under control. But that's a really good, that's a really good question. We'll move on to the next one. Um, uh, you have a comment from Lenka uh, about how fantastic the project is. Um, I'm sure that can be communicated privately as well so you know uh, what she thinks. The question is about um, the link between um, the, uh, the regime emergency and the patterns of cohesion and um, 
and perhaps uh, specifically the the origins of those links or disruptions in the uh, post-Stalin elite cohesion. Yeah, so I think what Link is getting at here is the question of whether the elites that experienced the post-Stalinist transition might in some way be different to those that didn't. Um, and that there might be like an endogeneity problem there, Link. I think you probably, if you nod along, you can, yeah. Um, I don't want to get too lost in the weeds here. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, a lot. Czechoslovakia is different, as you say, because there was a longer period of transition. But even in Czechoslovakia, the communists took control of the Ministry of the Interior and the secret police relatively quickly, even before they took control of the, the whole government. But there are also other similarities among the elites. So for example, the cases that I know best, Poland and Germany, in, in those two cases, you had the creation of a new communist party, a forced alliance between the communist party and the social democrats, for example, that happened in Poland and in East Germany as well. Um, I, I think that there were differences and that's one of the reasons why I have these case studies to speak in detail about the development of the parties. Um, but, but I don't think that the dis differences are systematic and also, I don't think the differences cause the divergence, i.e. I don't think the differences in the party structures before 1953 caused the divergence and whether one experienced a post stalinist transition or not. So for example, in East Germany, the case that I know the best, there was actually a huge revolution in June 1953. And in fact, Ulbricht was supposed to be removed from power. In fact, Stalin, uh, sorry, not Stalin, but uh, Beria and Molotov and others had decided that Ulbricht would be removed from power. But then, uh, actually it was events in Moscow that led Ulbricht to be summoned to Moscow for a dressing down and he was restored to power and flew back to East Berlin and proceeded to purge his cabinet and reinstate his Stalinist coalition. So that sort of dynamic where you see that in those few months after Stalin's death, it really was such a knife edge situation so Ulbricht, for example, was, was summoned to, uh, to Moscow for addressing down and, and remained in power. But uh, in other cases, the leaders were summoned to Mo Moscow and then removed from power. So there's a lot of variation there. And I don't think that the fact that there are different, slightly different institutional structures before 1953 had an effect on whether there was a post stalinist transition or not in those critical few months or years after the Stalin's death. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, opportunity for more conversations, I'm sure. Yeah, I think so. Um, so um, I'm um, actually uh, going to, um, uh, Tyler, why don't you go ahead and ask your question because I can't possibly do it justice without um, uh, speaking it in your voice instead of mine. What, do you think I have a Russian accent or something? <laughs> something. Uh, Henry, you can probably read it for yourself. Uh, my name's Vladimir Vutin, and I have a violence delegation problem. How can your new theory help me? Yeah, you know, Putin actually worked in uh, Dresden as a relatively junior KGB functionary. Uh, so he would have seen the Stasi up close and personal. And... Uh, I think the thing about Putin that's really kind of interesting, and other people know more about this case than I do, so Margaret, tell me if I'm wrong, but Putin is a former secret police officer. Obviously, he knows the secret police relatively well. And one of the things that he's done is to uh, reconsolidate power among the secret police agencies in Russia that had been relatively fragmented under Yeltsin. So this is an interesting process to basically re-enable the uh, the coercive agency or the coercive apparatus and give it more power, which is something that I only see in my cases in Poland uh, under the military government in the 1980s. So in the 1980s in Poland, you have a civil emergency after the rise of solidarity uh, regime crisis. They reestablish power under the military and that's when they grow the, uh, the coercive apparatus again. And I think that that's what's happened in Russia. I think uh, Putin uh, was able to reconsolidate control over the Russian elites, uh, including over the military, as we saw with his uh, suppression of opposition in Chechnya, for example. And he was also 
able to re-establish control over the uh, broader coercive and security apparatus because he himself knew so much about that apparatus and probably had so many allies within it. And so that's why he's been willing to re-enable that apparatus, allow it to grow stronger, more consolidated and larger uh, in the same way that the Polish government did when they basically brought in the generals to run the secret police. Under Jaruzelski in the 1980s, he removed the secret police uh, officers who were in charge and simply put his generals in charge. So I think that that's similar to what uh, Putin has done. So I guess my answer to you, Tyler, is Vladimir Putin doesn't have a dele violence delegation problem. He solved it in the early 2000s. That's why his secret police are so powerful. Thanks. Uh, James has a question about the functions of secret police across different states. Um, were they the same, uh, or they, in, in other words, were they more secretive in some places than others? So was there a difference, or the, were, was it the same? And were there um, potentially just sort of regular policing activities that some of them engaged in, as well as the sort of secretive side? Um, and I guess his question is ultimately about the willingness of the state to invest in, um, in policing of any sort, especially the secretive type. And um, so just wanted to see if it came out and maybe this comes out in your analysis anyway, but uh, do you have any responses? Yeah, I actually don't have data on the regular police forces. Every one of these countries had a regular police force, whether they were called the People's Police, like in Germany or the militia or in Poland, there was a regular police force as well that engaged in regular policing. And they obviously worked together with the secret police or the state security ministry or whatever it was called. But I don't collect data on the, on the regular police and I don't really look at the delegation between the two because um, at least in the cases that I know best, and I think in some places, for example, in China at the moment, this, this line is a little bit more fuzzy than it was in, in communist Eastern Europe. The, suppression of political opposition and dissent was really the job of the secret police, whereas general public safety and order was the job of the, of the regular police. And because I'm interested in political dissent and repression, I focus on those secret police agencies. But there is some variation, James. Things get a little messy when you start. At times, some of the functions of the regular police or the border guards and things are integrated into the secret police and then they're taken back out and things get a little messy in that way. So the, even in these cases, the, the border is, or the division is not as clear cut as it could be. The, um, so one of the questions that, uh, has, that came up was, uh, it, it was asked earlier, but it was asked by someone who had asked another question, so I held on to it, um, was, um, is there any correlation um, or connection between um, places that had, um, you know, low tenure for secret police between, between the secret police tenure and the tenure of other, um, other ministers in, in those countries? So, in other words, was everybody, did everybody have low tenure or uh, was it uniquely the secret police? Everyone except the Minister of Defense seemed to have relatively similar um, tenures, except that the secret police uh, under the Stalinist regimes also seemed to have had uh, long tenures. So it looks like ministers of agriculture, finance, foreign affairs were sort of rotated fairly regularly, but the ministers of defense and the secret police were kept in place for a very long time, uh, except in those places where we saw these post-Stalinist transitions when the secret police leaders were rotated a lot, a lot more often. But um, in general, I think it's really interesting that in these communist countries, the, um, the those people that have uh, coercive capacity, the secret police and the military chiefs, um, seem to stay in power longer than others, in some cases, or many cases at least. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned that all of these countries represent uh, dictatorships, party dictatorships. Um, and there's a typology by Jessica Weeks about the type of, um, of dictatorship and suggests that uh, non-personalist regimes um, uh, two types, that is military juntas and non-military juntas. 
Um, do all these countries belong to the same category? That is, do they all have either a military junta or are they a machine dictator? Uh, I think they all belong to the same typology of single party dictatorships for almost every categorization. One of the interesting things that Weeks does is she's interested in foreign policy decisions of autocracies and she looks at the control of the um, she looks at the control of the autocrat over the secret police. And I think she would uh, argue that all of these states had the same level of control over the secret police. But what I show is that actually there's a lot of variation even among these otherwise very similar regimes. Oh, Link is asking whether that was, was Geddes. Link, I think I would have to go back and look at the week's different categorizations again. I know that there are lots of different categorizations of these regimes and I, I'm not entirely sure what, how, how Weeks's definitions of military versus non-military hunters work out. But I mean, these are all autocratic parties. These are party system autocracies. Right. They were not run by military hunters. So that's right. Thanks, Lincoln. Um, from Madison, um, a Skettle student. Uh, how, how does contemporary politics, uh, especially ideologically related, influenced your research? Uh, in Romania, the Securite was a communist secret police, but in present day Romania, they have pervasive anti-communist sentiments, which potentially influenced the information Romania has released about the Securite. Do you see uh, governments attempting to misconstrue history in the process of uh, you know, de-secretizing? Well, I, I haven't done an in-depth study of the um, politics of the politics of memory, as they call it, in Central and Eastern Europe around these topics, uh, except to the extent that I've investigated the bias that this politics might be introducing into the data that I'm analyzing. And so I'm very aware of the problems that are going on in these different countries around how the secret police archives are used, um, how much access is granted to them, et cetera. Um, but I haven't really done a lot of in-depth study into how the use of or misuse of the secret police archives have influenced contemporary politics in say Poland or Romania or, uh, or Bulgaria. I know a little bit more about this in East Germany where the rules are extremely strict about what information can be divulged, for example, there was for a long time a sitting member of the German Bundestag uh, who had collaborated with uh, Stasi, but no one knew on what capacity and no one was able to find that out because his personal information was completely secret. Now, if that had happened in Poland, his information might not have been protected to the same degree. So I know that these things have been finding themselves out. That's not uh, really the focus of my research. I've tried to, I've tried to, um, examine the effects of those political disputes for my data collection, but I, it's not my, uh, it's not really my area of expertise, but it is super interesting. What's the um, difference between um, you, the strategy you have employed looking across multiple countries uh, versus for explanatory and analytical purposes, um, focusing on two countries and um, illustrating the you know the, the strong differences between them yeah that's a good question so the book is divided into two parts and the first part of the book is a paired comparison of east germany and poland uh, and then the second half of the book is taking the dynamics that we see there and extrapolating from them to test and see whether we see them in the data for all other cases as well so what I'm trying to do with the case studies is really um, flesh out a lot of the material that you obviously can't see in these quantitative studies about things like the mechanisms, whether the, whether the development of the secret police really was similar before 1953, whether Stalin's, uh, for example, Lenker's question, I explore this in more detail for Poland and East Germany, whether the effects of Stalin's death were correlated with uh, features of the regimes before 1953. I can do that in a lot more detail with these two case studies. But then, of course, even though there are only six cases, there is a lot of variation among those cases. And I'm able to go not into a huge amount of detail as much as I can with the two case studies, but some detail in the quantitative case studies, where, for example, I talk about 
why I called code Bulgaria as a post-Stalinist transition, even though it was kind of a negotiated transition at a party congress from one wing of the next and things like that. So I guess I guess I'm trying to do both things in the book um, and uh, and get around those problems that way. But it's a good question. Carol Macmillan asks um, if the the death of Stalin is seen as a singular event that was an opportunity for um, an ambitious um, person to seize power in the midst of the disruption. Um, is, you know, is that how we should see it? Um, a, a unique event that um, allows the disruptions that occurred or is there some uh, other, other factors to think about other than just the death of Stalin? Yeah, I think that it was a permissive moment. It was a critical juncture. It was an exogenous shock, but it was a permissive moment because we see variation in outcomes after 1953. So there was a general uh, air of crisis, obviously. Um, there were, the Soviets recalled a lot of their secret, most of their secret police advisors from the whole region or they were expelled. They withdrew some or a lot of their military advisors from the militaries. Uh, it was clear that the Soviets were not going to determine internal politics in these states as much as they had before. So the era of Stalinism and a, a kind of a more homogeneous Stalinism was definitely over, but which direction each country went, it was quite unclear. So in Poland, for example, uh, Gomułka was able to mobilize mass support to help him overthrow Beirut, Whereas in uh, East Germany, the, the mass uprising was suppressed by the Soviets and then the incumbent was supported by the Soviets to remain in place. He, he paid lip service to a policy change after 1953 that never followed through. So it was, a, it was definitely a critical juncture, but it was a moment where it was a permissive moment. There was no new line that was handed down from Moscow. Um, there was a hint of a new line. In fact, uh, Beria, for a time, it was thought that Beria was going to try and disengage from East Germany in particular, that Beria was going to try and allow the reunification of Western East Germany in order to get Marshall Plan aid for the Soviet Union and for Eastern Europe. But then when Beria was purged, that all uh, went away. So there was a lot of flux. There was a lot of uh, room for agency uh, among the political elites in that particular moment, uh, 1953, 1956 before Khrushchev's speech, basically, in 1956. That's where we see the re-establishment of some sort of a common line from the Soviet Union. Was there um, more of a demand for um, coercion in the, fall, in the, in the follow-up from Stalin's death um, as the communism was being somewhat delegitimized and um, there might there not have been in some of these states a kind of demand for coercive control again, um, especially um, that might have prompted the elite to cohere together to try to hold on to power, et cetera. Um, any thoughts? This is Margaret's question. Yeah, so I might um, answer the second part first, which is whether public support had an impact on elite cohesion before 1953. Um, I don't, I think there were, there was a lot of public discontent against these Stalinist regimes in almost every case, and there was a lot of violent suppression of that dissent. But in every case in 1953, I think in every single state, perhaps except Hungary, there was some sort of revolutionary movement, or not movement, but revolutionary uprising in 1953. So you had a nationwide uprising in East Germany, you had a workers uprising in Poznan and Poland, you had a workers uprising in Pilsen and Czechoslovakia, you had a strike of tractor workers uh, in Romania and uh, also a strike of workers in Bulgaria. So there's a lot of similarities and patterns of mass opposition, both uh, before the Stalinist transition and at the moment of Stalinist transition. So I think that it's not that they were exactly the same, these movements, but I think that you can say that there were broad similarities now, after the post-Stalinist transition, what's really interesting is that where we see more mass opposition, so we think more demand for repression from the, from the elites, right? The elites are going to want to repress opposition more, particularly in Poland, 
that's where the that's where the secret police are small. That's where there aren't many secret policemen. So in Poland, uh, you have recurring mass revolutionary unrest that is completely out of control and the government is having to use the military from the late 60s. From the late 60s through the late 70s, there are recurring uh, mass revolutionary uprising, including one 1970 that brings down uh, Gamoika and his uh, successor comes in and still they don't grow the secret police. I think that's one of the more compelling uh, parts of my argument, which is that, in fact, where we would expect mass unrest to be driving the elites to grow their secret police agencies in Poland, they keep the secret police agencies small. Why would do they do that? Well, I explain it by saying that they don't believe that they can control the secret police. Um, they've had an insubordination, they've had an attempted coup by a secret police chief, they've had the disruption of their Stalinist coalition and they simply won't grow the secret police uh, whereas in East Germany, there's no mass discontent until 1988-89. There's none. Uh, there's no uh, revolutionary movement in East Germany, and yet they continue to grow the Stasi more and more and more. So the outcomes actually go in the inverse direction. Where there's more mass unrest, you'd, where you'd expect them to grow the secret police, they shrink it. And where there's less mass unrest, where you expect them to allow the secret police to ossify or shrink, they grow the secret police. So I think that um, those two things go in the complete opposite uh, expected direction, which I think is a really compelling puzzle, part of the puzzle here as well. We have about uh, 10, 15 minutes left and uh, there's almost nobody in the queue. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let people ask their own questions, but I'm gonna turn to Peter first because I think he submitted a question, but perhaps was not, it was cut off because the, the question never arrives in the chat function. So Peter, you, yes. uh, are, you tried again. So go ahead and uh, uh, ask your question and then I'll, I'll allow others. Uh, I, I will only cut, cut things if uh, we're, uh, we've got a long queue, so. Ross, I, uh, I hit, hit the wrong key and then I lo lost confidence in my question, so I didn't try it. Um, but so, um, my qu my questions go to the the size issue, not the 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 brief tenures of the the, um, um, the the question of the tenure of the secret police leaders. But so the two questions, Henry. One was sort of how much influence did the KGB have on the East European security s services? You know, did they outsource jobs to them? Um, uh, could, could that be an, a, a part of an explanation of what happened? And my, my second question is, the, the, Romania doesn't fit this question, but uh, could the, the, the size of the East German security forces be explained by the intensity of the Cold War conflict in, in, in that you know, East and West Germany, Berlin Wall eventually, and, um, and so on. So, um, that those were my two questions. Not very good questions. No, they're good questions. Um, definitely good questions that I get a lot. So the question about the KGB, um, the, the KGB advisors were in Eastern Europe in every single case except Bulgaria. So Bulgaria is the only state where the KGB didn't basically construct these security institutions. In fact, in Poland, it was a Soviet citizen and former Red Army officer called Rakiewicz who actually built the Polish Bezpika secret police agency after the war. But in every case after 1953, they radically reduced or eliminated the number of advisors that they had within these institutions. They were literally giving orders and telling people what to do. So before 1953, there are all these stories of uh, secret police officers uh, basically having KGB officers standing over them or KGB officers arriving at critical moments, for example, during this uprising in June 1953, the East German secret police basically didn't know what to do because they were so used to being told what to do by the Soviets. Now, after 1953, the KGB's role in directing domestic repression basically was eliminated. But all of these agencies cooperated in many, many different ways. So there was a formal cooperation agreement between all of these uh, agencies. They met for regular 
uh, summits. I've read some of the minutes of the summits where they all met in Prague, for example, the chiefs of these secret police agencies, and they had formal memorandas of, uh, of up understanding. But they mostly related to foreign surveillance and sorry, espionage and counter espionage. They mostly cooperated spying on the Americans and on NATO and on deterring intelligence operations by NATO and the CIA and other uh, organizations like that. So, the, you know, if you listen to some of these guys from the Stasi, they'll tell you that by the 80s, they were providing most of the Soviets intelligence on NATO because they had very high ranking spies within the federal German government for obvious reasons. They were able to plant very good spies. So they were cooperating with the KG, KGB on foreign intelligence, but not very much on domestic uh, repression. Now, the question about the Cold War is really interesting. I get that a lot. And that's the sort of explanation that historians of the Stasi use a lot, as they say, oh, after 1961, they built the Berlin Wall, and there was a new phase of uh, repression that started with the Stasi. And A, um, it's not really true. If you look at the size of the Stasi, it just grew almost at an almost constant pace. So if, when you look at the data, you can't really discern these things in the case of the Stasi. And secondly, the intensity of surveillance in the country just it just increased through time, and the the high point of the Cold War was really in the in the fifties and before they closed the border, when people were able to leave, when NATO and West German spies were able to come and go freely in the country. So it doesn't really explain the growth of the agency. And I think that the Romanian case is also really instructive here. The, Romania is very far removed from uh, West Germany and the the Fulda Gap and the kind of key battlegrounds of the Cold War. Um, they take uh, under Ceausescu, they take an explicitly anti-Soviet stance. Ceausescu takes a lot of pleasure in trying to show his distance from the Soviets, and yet their agency ends up being, along with the Stasi, the biggest, most uh, surveillance-heavy uh, surveillance heavy apparatus. And so the, I only have six cases. I can't definitively prove my hypotheses here, but I can sort of rally a lot of uh, arguments to say, you know, I don't think that this is just, I don't think that this is just about East Germany. There's definitely something about East Germany, you know. When I run these regressions, the, the fixed effect for Germany, East Germany is always very large and statistically significant. The intercept for East Germany is always somewhere else, okay, so there's something going on. But I, that's not what I'm looking at in the models. I'm looking at variation while holding that constant. And I still find a lot of interesting variation. But I could talk about the East Germans and Milka until the cows come home. Uh, but I'll do that at Casey Moore's later. DS, I think that's uh, David Soroki, is that right? Yeah, that's me. Yes. Thank you for your comment about the research design. Yeah, I was just thinking actually uh, as you spoke about uh, this that maybe uh, to deal with the criticism that uh, East Ger Germany is an outlier that instead of comparing that to Poland to compare to other cases like maybe Romania versus Bulgaria that have often been compared to each other in other studies for different things okay. maybe it, you don't want to do a whole new uh, study of that but maybe you know, you could do half of one or, I don't know, what shadow study or something. Yeah, I thought um, the Bulgarian case is quite interesting because it's almost a, um, a divergent case because it, it, remains, it remains a very large agency, even though they have a post-Stalinist transition. But it sort of fits my theory because the post-Stalinist transition wasn't as violent. It occurred in a controlled, consensual way at a party congress. So the disruption to the party elite wasn't as severe. And so I thought of including at least some material on that. And I think you're right that the Romania case, because the data on Romania are so patchy, some more qualitative evidence could be really useful, particularly because it's in that same category as East Germany. Are there other questions? Uh, just a small follow-up on this issue uh, that 
you said you you know you could do this with in a qualitative like another case study but you could also do it potentially depending on how much data you have in the same difference in difference you know all as framework that you did for the two groups but instead here you hmm. you have um you know you have just two two cases so you don't need the interaction term you know you can just uh, use a difference in in uh, fixed or intercept yeah that's a nice idea the other thing is that if i only looked at two cases i might be able to find other variables too because i can only for the all six cases the only comparable data i've been able to collect are on size in terms of informants and staff but i might be able to find other outcomes that were comparable if i just looked at two cases the data i mean the data collection problems are, are significant when i started this project i didn't think that it would be possible um but I just for years have been reading and reading and reading and collecting, you know, like a data point here, a data point there. It's come together okay, but still has a lot of problems. No, I, I admire that you have tried to put a model on this problem. And whereas, you know, with six cases, you could potentially say, you know, here, you know, three chapter qualitative chapters comparing two by two and, and uh, theory, and, th and that would also be fine. But I think trying to do this also is, has its merits and obviously its challenges. One of the ways I tried to get around it was this using the individual level data on the ministers because that was actually relatively easy to collect uh, and just to find another dependent variable, you know, so I, I've, I've done my best. Yeah, so far. Not, not hearing any other questions, um, I'm leaving a pause to let someone ask a question. We're just a couple minutes from the end, so it will be quite fine to end. Sure. And, Thanks, everyone. Um, I forgot to pull down the. I, I have a quick question for Henry. Uh, what are you going to order at Casey Moore's? Chicken, chicken fingers, delicious. And to drink. Oh, uh, yeah, something, uh, an adult beverage of my choice. Coors Light. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for the interjection, Helen. Um, I'd like to uh, let you know as you're getting ready to leave that uh, next week, um, we have Robert Sugden from the University of East Anglia. Uh, professor of uh, philosophy and uh, he's a philosopher of economics. I don't know whether he's an economist or a philosopher. Um, on uh, his recent work on the community of advantage, um, uh, looking at both positively and negatively sort of behavioral arguments about um, uh, cooperation in society and uh, a strong criticism actually of some of the behavioral approaches uh, to um, thinking about. Uh, markets. So um, I look forward to seeing many of you next week and uh, we continue this uh, throughout the year um, on Friday afternoons. And thank you all for attending. <laughs>